sort it out. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Lord, help us to receive that. In John 4, it says that, 1 John 4, it says that here in his love, true love, that he loved us first. Hallelujah. Not, not us. But this is true love. That he, the Father, through Jesus, loved us first. Lord, help us to receive that. Your love. Because no fear can stand against true love. Thank you, Father. We praise you. Give the Lord a shout. <laughs> Hallelujah. Rise up, church. It's time to quit playing around. Jesus is the Lamb of God, but he is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Thank you, Father. It's time to let the lion roar for boldness. Get your dancing shoes on. No more depression. No more feeling sorry for yourself. You're not a victim. You're a victor through the blood of Jesus. Get those dancing shoes on. You have all the peace and the love and the joy of Christ in your born-again spirit. Let it out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Worship you, Father. Thank you, Father, for being here amongst us. Hallelujah. Woo! Anybody want to dance? <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here, moving amongst us. We honor you, Father. We honor you. We honor you, Father, for your goodness. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, praise God. Uh, I guess I'll say one way we love God is how? By loving one another. Just give somebody a hug and, a, and we'll be back. Hallelujah. Everybody can take their seats. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Who came expectant? Who's ready to receive? Hallelujah. God's ready to pour it out. It's up to us to receive it. Amen. So the announcements for this week are Monday prayer meeting here from noon to one. And Tuesday evening, sorry, not Tuesday, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock is Bible study. Going through the book, Be All of God by John Bevere. So everybody is welcome. And also tonight we have daylight saving time starting. So your clocks will spring forward. So everybody's going to miss an hour of sleep tonight. <laughs> Yay, not. <laughs> so... Yeah, okay, I'll turn it over to Lee. Yeehaw, we all get to get up an hour early. If you had a goal to get up an hour early, this will help. <laughs> Maybe. Hallelujah. Were you, are you ready to honor the Lord? Yeah, I just had to think when I was talking about, you know, we honor you, Father. Right here is an opportunity. You know, when it talks in the word about honoring, it can mean in your finances. Hallelujah. So, go with me to Psalms. I've been, I've been in Psalms lately a little bit. Psalms 112, which I like the scripture. Psalms 112, 1 through 3. <clears throat> So verse 1 says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord and that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Say, that's me. Hallelujah, that's me. Then verse 2, His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. 
And I'm going to believe for that, that my seed is mighty on the earth. Hallelujah. That our seed that we're offering tonight or that you have offered, you can believe is mighty on the earth. That God is taking it forth and multiplying it. Thank you, Lord. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. And then verse 3, wealth and riches shall be in his house. Whose house? My house. Amen. That's my house. Wealth and riches shall be in my house, and his righteousness endures forever. Thank you, Father. Okay, let's go over to this wealth and riches kind of caught my eye. So let's go over to Psalm, um, actually it's Proverbs 3. Had us. Yeah, Proverbs 3. Um, let's start at 13. It says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. You want to be happy? <laughs> if you're not happy, here it is. Get wisdom and get understanding. And you can be happy. What fascinates me, that word happy could also be translated prosperous. So, there you go. Prosperous. For, then verse 14. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than r- rubies and all the things that you can desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand and her left hand, riches and honor. I was reading this thinking, you know, at one point I would have read this and been like, well, see, that's just, you know, in the spiritual. You know, these things, see, wisdom, you know, it's, it's in wisdom, so nothing in the natural could be like it. But then it goes on, says, length of days is, in her right hand, or verse 17 says, her ways, this is talking about wisdom, are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. So we can have peace, like, manifest in our life. We don't have to be out of peace. So if we can have peace, then we can also have the rest of this too. But it starts coming from the wisdom. And as we know that the wisdom Jesus is the king of wisdom, or the king of peace. Hallelujah. And then verse 18 says, She's a tree of life to them that lay a hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. And there we have that word happy again, or could be transferred, or the word prosperous could have been used there. And prosperous is every one that retaineth her. Hallelujah. I want to retain wisdom because there's prosperity attached to it. Amen. So you get to give more. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. What I thought is interesting of these scriptures, if you back way back up, like come after, you know, as a fame, I've already shared these scriptures often here, is, you know, in verse 9 it says, Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. So this is all kind of connected. Hallelujah. So I just want to encourage you in that. that we can be happy. <laughs> I just kind of, kind of stuck out to me today. Happy. You know, be happy. Even in your giving, be happy. <laughs> your flesh wants especially. Amen. Be happy. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I know. In the, in the natural, our minds and our can rise up like, grr, you know. <laughs> When it comes to tithing and offerings, this is a subject that I wrestled with a long time, and I still have questions on it. But hallelujah. I'm going to be happy about it. <laughs> so if y'all stand, stand up, we're going to bring our offerings in front of the Lord. And I'm going to decree some decrees. Debt's paid off. <clears throat> hallelujah. We decree you begin receiving divine and unexpected financial provision to meet every need. We say that debts and deficits are removed and bills are paid on time every time. Well, that word deficit just jumped at me. But there's no more deficits. Hallelujah. Yes, debts paid in full, but also no deficits. We speak that there is financial peace in your life, and what has been lacking begins to be filled and supplied. 
we declare that increase begins to surround your life long term. And we declare a settling of all financial problems and issues. We say you receive gainful employment and stable income for your work. In Jesus' name, we bind the enemy's power to create excess breakdowns and repairs causing expenses that rob your resources. We declare financial provision comes now. Thank you, Father. We're going to increase more and more, us and our children. Father, thank you. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for the opportunity to sow into your kingdom. We bring these tithes and offerings to you, Father that you've promised that you open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we can't contain and that you, that you will rebuke the devourer for our sakes. We thank you. We remind you of this, and we thank you of these promises. In Jesus' name, amen. I guess no music. I, I was, no music. Okay. I, I, was, I should have asked, but hallelujah. Well, while we take up the offering, I'll introduce our pastor. Jay Stosfis. <laughs> oh, that's kind of fun doing that. <laughs> <clears throat> I guess you got to prepare for bigger things, amen? I kind of thought, I know I took Lee by surprise tonight when I handed him the mic, but the Lord had told me earlier, and then I totally forgot about it, and I was so into what God was downloading into me, he gave me another sermon while I'm sitting here <laughs> in worship that I lost track of worship, so I guess it ended and I wasn't with it. I have something I want to read here. I took a screenshot of this. <clears throat> the, uh, it's by a pastor that I know um, from Karis Bible College. Uh, were you guys, did you personally meet uh, Barry Bennett? Or was he one of the instructors when Lee was there? So he was one of the instructors when Lee was there. So Lee would have met him personally. This is at Karis Bible College over in Colorado Springs, or actually it's now up in, uh, in uh, what's the town name? Uh, Woodland Park. But Barry Bennett posted this on Facebook, and it really hit home for me. He says, greed, question mark. Is it greed for a farmer to expect a harvest from the seed he has planted? Genesis 26, 12 through 14. Is it greed for Jesus to expect a return on the grace He invested in you? Is it greed for the cheerful giver to expect all grace, to have all sufficiency, and to be enriched in all liberality? To think about that verse when Lee was talking about uh, what he was saying. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. Is it greed when Jesus promised press down, shaken together, and running over to those who give? Luke 6, 38. Is it greed that the one who scatters shall see increase? Proverbs eleven twenty four through 25. Is it greed when those who give sacrificially should be promised all their needs be met according to His riches? Philippians four fifteen through 19. Is it greed to honor the Lord with our possessions and from our increase and to then have our barns filled with plenty? Is it greed to seek first His kingdom? Uh, is it greed uh, to seek first His kingdom and righteousness and have things added to you? Is it greed for God to expect a harvest from the seed? Jesus, Revelation 7, verse 9. A lot of times people will um, talk about when God wants to prosper you and it's all over His Word, the Word will prosper you. They will begin to label things greed. So he's asking these questions. Now I want to go to the next one. When believers get offended at the subject of increase, it is evident that their hearts haven't been fully converted by the love of God. Shall I read that again? When believers get offended at the subject of increase, it is evident that their hearts haven't been fully converted by the love of God. This is why Lee can uh, every single week can come up here and preach a tithe and offering message and I can sit right here in the front row as a pastor and receive what God has given him. And I can't wait to hear from what Lee has to say because I am going to grow in this. I'm going to come if you get offended at this. What does offended mean? Oh, I wish Lee wouldn't have, I wish they wouldn't uh, it would sound a little bit like this. I wish they wouldn't focus 
on the tithe and offering so much at Church of the Word. That's you being offended. Jesus thought it was important enough that He gave you instruction in His Scripture so that it can be counted, Paul says, according to your account, so that you can lay up treasure in heaven. Jesus put it in the Word so that you can lay up treasure in heaven. Apparently, Jesus thought it was important enough to put it in Scripture. And part of the reason we focus is we have fallen so short on what God really wants with our increase because He truly wants to increase us. The Word of God prospers me. It prospers you. It prospers the person over in Africa. It prospers the people in Ukraine. It prospers the people in India. I had this question when I first got familiar with the, 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 what, what some people label the prosperity gospel. And I sat with a, um, a, an evangelist from India, sat across the table from him, and w- this was the burning question in my heart. I said, uh, Pastor Israel, how does the prosperity gospel work in Ukraine? Or sorry, in Indi- India. And he, without missing a beat, looked at me. He's like, we preach the gospel. And sometimes we don't get back to that village for two, three, four, or even five years. And when we come back to that village, the whole village is saved. Their crops grow higher and better than the neighboring villages. And they have bicycles uh, uh, in the village. And I'm like, bicycles? And he looked at me and he says, a bicycle in India is like having a BMW in your driveway. The gospel prospers everywhere it goes. What happens is people, Christians, do not know how to deal with prosperity when they're prospered and feel guilty when they're prospered. Because the church has taught it's wrong. Got to be careful about them rich people. God doesn't care about you being rich. God cares about you being covetous. And a lot of people don't understand the difference. I don't know what a lot of Christians are going to do when they get to heaven. They're going to look at them uh, streets of gold and go, oh, too much prosperity for me. (laughs) Are you going to be able to live in heaven with your thought process? God brings His sapphire stone down with Him and it's His footstool. Sapphire. Oh, but God can have that. We can't. Well, there is part of us being uh, in, in, in still renewing our minds in this. And I'm telling you, Jesus talked a lot about money. You go through and begin to look at what Jesus talked about, and He talked a lot about money. Because here's why. Money is, is where we get caught up so much. So thank you, Lee for continuing to preach truth and continue to, to give us insight on how we can grow in this. Because we still have, I still find such negative thought processes in my mind and in my heart that I got to change. And it's because of, my, of uh, what, I was in, what was ingrained in me and now I got to uproot what was ingrained in me and bring faith to it. Amen? I didn't finish this. The, what, what Barry Bennett said. That was just the first sentence on what he's talking about. When believers get offended at the subject of increase, it is evident that their hearts haven't been fully converted by the love of God. Growth and increase are the very nature of God and His Word. Didn't He send His Word to prosper? Isaiah 55, 11. Isn't poverty a result of the curse of the sin? Of sin? Why would we hate sin and then embrace its result as holy? Some people say poverty is what God wants for you and you should God's teaching you this and He desires this for you. And you just think about this. If poverty is the result of the curse of sin, why would we hate sin and then embrace its results as holy? Sickness is poverty and lack is poverty. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. Proverbs 10.15 Most who reject the message of the grace for increase have homes, cars, and bank accounts. I've said this before, but we need to really... Anybody want deliverance in this thinking? 
I do. I want continued deliverance in this. Most who reject the message of the grace for increase have homes, cars, and bank accounts. Are we, are, 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 do most people have homes, cars, and bank accounts? They aren't against prosperity as long as they think they earned it themselves. I've said, I've made this statement. It's only in theory God doesn't want to prosper you for two hours on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning and then the rest of the week you try to prosper yourself. So right there you already know it's a theory. It only sounds holy in church. They aren't against prosperity as long as they think they earned it themselves. They don't honor their source. They don't expect His blessing and they get offended at those who talk about the blessing of God. That is why so many in the church are the tail and not the head. God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may, may have an abundance for every good work, which is what you were saying a little earlier. How many want abundance for every good work? I've woken up in the morning and, and, I'm, and, and I don't have enough money for the needs I see. And as pastor, sometimes I'm privy to a lot of more needs than maybe you. I get phone calls on needs. I get on, on possibilities of, of meeting people's needs, and sometimes I have to say no. And I have to go back to that verse, and I have to say, I want more prosperity and more life so I, in my life so I can meet more needs that I see people have. Amen? So believe by faith with me. It's okay to confess these things. My bills are paid in the name of Jesus. Right? My bills are paid in the name of Jesus. That's not being selfish. That's just taking what the Word is saying and speaking out what God has given us in His Word because He truly is wanting to prosper us. If your bills are paid, then you begin to speak and say, Lord, give me more vision for more need. See, that's the prayer you may not want to pray. huh? Lord, give me more vision for more need. And all of a sudden, you don't make enough. I don't care if you're a millionaire. And you, go and, and you believe God for those needs to be met again. And, but it starts with more vision for more need. Because I'm telling you, there's lots of need out there. You just simply haven't Receive vision from heaven on some of these things. And when you do, God will flood you with vision and then you'll realize, you know what? I might, have, I might be a millionaire and I, it's not even close. It's not even close. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, that was what God was downloading into me today. And, um, but I want to go back to Romans chapter 10. We've been on a series called The Word of Faith That We Preach. The Word of Faith That We Preach. Am I afraid of, my, uh, of what people label me as, as the Word of Faith preacher? No. No, I, I started meditating on, on a verse the other week, uh, I think it was a week or two ago, that uh, what, what do you do with the verse that everything that is not of faith is what? Tell me the verse again. What does it say? Whatever is not of what? Is what? So is the faith walk important? The word of faith that we preach, is it important? Is the word of faith that we preach very important in our lives? How do you keep from sinning? Stay in faith. How do you keep from sinning? How do you stay sin free? Stay in faith. What is the lie that began all the way back in the garden and is still being told today? What's the lie? God's holding back. Really, what was the serpent trying to get to Eve? The serpent was saying, I mean, I want you to think about this, and I want you to think of your own life. 
how often you do this. How many trees did God make that they could eat? We don't even have a number. But how many do you think it was? It was more than enough for Adam and Eve, wasn't it? And which tree did we focus on? Which tree did the serpent focus on? The one they were not to eat. So they had hundreds, maybe thousands of trees to eat from. But the serpent comes and says, you know that one tree. Now what would have been the appropriate response? What what should have been the appropriate response to the temptation? Look at all God gave us. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? So, so the, see, Satan starts off as a serpent. He starts off and, and his first question is, hath God said? And so the answer to hath God said should have been, God said we can have all these trees. And it's more than enough. And it meets every single need. Because apparently they did not need the tree that gave them the knowledge of good and evil, did they? They didn't need to eat that one. Because God said don't, because they didn't need it. Every one of their needs was met in the trees that He gave. But the serpent got them to focus on the one that they couldn't have. We hasn't changed. How many times do you focus on what you don't have? How how often do you focus on what you don't have or what you didn't do? I mean, surely nobody here, right? End of the day, you lay in bed. What do you focus on? Everything you got done or all the stuff you didn't get done? Everything you got accomplished or all the stuff you didn't get accomplished? All your shortcomings or all your blessings? Right? See, the enemy hasn't changed a lick, has he? He, he's, he uses the same temptation. And we're still here. And, and, and people are like, well, um, you know, you don't have to be confused on why he uses the same strategy because it continues to work. He's not using a different strategy. But I'm here to tell you, you can change. You can change this. And I'm going to give you the secret on how to change it tonight. It's the word of faith that we speak. Anything that is not of sin. See, you can, you can try to act like the faith Faith, uh, we don't have to emphasize faith and, and it's just the milk of the Word and we should move on to the meat. But it begins with the very premise that, any, that it, whatever is not of faith is sin. How do I sin? By getting out of faith. By getting into unbelief. You can take any sin and it's because you have stopped being in faith on something. Amen? Take anything. Um, this is what God was downloading to me. I don't know. Maybe we'll get into it tonight. A lot of Christendom focuses on weaknesses. A lot of Christendom, a lot of Christianity focuses on your weakness. What is your weakness? What haven't you done? What have you done that is wrong and you call it a weakness? Scripture doesn't call it a weakness. You know what the Scripture calls it? You must have been in my study. It's a stronghold. Scripture calls it a stronghold. And the Lord showed me tonight how faith brings that stronghold down and it's the righteousness righteousness of faith that you speak that brings down that stronghold. Your, see, we were taught what? A lot of us were taught different than that. 
We were taught try harder, do better, change, effort. We were taught, well, you're, you're not trying hard enough, so, so you don't have enough effort. And if you'd really be godly, you'd have more effort. When Scripture says it completely different, you speak your faith, and instead of you being in effort, you're in speaking. How did, how did, did Abraham overcome what he was facing? How did Abraham, tell me. We went over this a number of times. How did Abraham overcome? Faith. So, so, so what did he not consider? He didn't consider his age. What does that mean? What does consider mean? Think about. He didn't take into account. He did not consider how old he was. He didn't consider his wife's age. I mean, he woke up every morning. And he looked over at Sarah and goes, and he's seen the wrinkles. And he didn't consider it. What did he believe? He believed what God said about what he was going to do. The same way, we, as we grow in this faith business, you wake up every morning and your body will speak to you. Right, Peggy? Your body will tell you how it aches and pains. The, the world will speak to you. Your emotions will speak to you. Everything you see speaks to you. How do you overcome those? How do you overcome? You overcome those things by believing something different. Believing something. You don't consider those things. You consider what God said. You consider what God put in His Word and what He's saying. But it doesn't become revelation to you till God put His Word in a book. But He didn't put it in a book to be in a book. Did He? He put His Word in the book so that you can open the book, you can read what He said, and now you can speak it. You can look at the book, read what he says, and speak it over your situation and over your life. It's the righteousness that we speak. Romans 10. Let's just read Romans 10. Romans 10, I believe it's verse 6 or verse 5. Romans 10, verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. See, this is where... uh, there was a lot of doing in the law. Don't, don't, don't disconnect from me. There was a lot of doing in the law, wasn't there? And, and, and in so that happening, and, and um, Christendom has adopted a lot of doing, and, and there is a part of doing we'll get to. There is a part of action that there is, that it's not just a, there's, there's a corresponding faith action to your words. It will manifest with with an action. So there's part of that, but it's after the fact, not before. You don't do things necessarily. You you are not, if you're in a, I have to do things to get faith, and we got it backwards. We need to stay in the mode that I'm exercising the word by faith, and now there will be a doing. Right? Right? For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. So how did you know you were righteous back in Moses' day? How did you know you were righteous? Keeping the law. And see, the law is there. Uh, Romans tells us it's a schoolmaster. Because there is a place that the law needs needs to take effect for people. You can go to places where the law of God has been completely nullified and people don't have a conscience. The law will bring about even an evil person having a conscience, but it's a schoolmaster. But now that we understand those principles, the law will will take you to Jesus. The law will expose you 
and you will realize I can't do enough to be righteous. You, you can't possibly do enough. And so then you go, I need help. Because I can't, I can't, I can't uh, do enough good acts. I can't dress good enough. I can't pray long enough. I can't fast enough to become righteous. You can't. It's impossible. It's impossible for you to do enough to become righteous. So then you're going to at some point go, I need Jesus. Because I can't do it all. I mean, dear Lord, I'm, I'm going to spend my whole life trying to be righteous. My, my, you can't go work. Who thinks you can go work at your job? You need to be praying. Because that's what holy people do. I remember, I remember going to a Bible school and people discussing you know, how long of your prayer life that you should have so that you're considered in good standing. And, and, and it's a, you're never going to get there. Well, I wake up and I spend one hour with the Lord. Okay. Okay. Don't you think two hours would be a little holier? If you'd spend two hours with the Lord, wouldn't that be a little more? Wouldn't you be able to achieve just a little more holiness in your life if you spend two hours? And, and, if, and if you say yes, well then how about three? And, and well, yeah, you know, that probably would get my, me on a way of more holiness, so how about four? Do you see how there's, this, this is never going to satisfy? Well then, you should spend all day in prayer. You'd really live a holy life if you'd spend all day in prayer. You don't have time to go work. You don't have time to eat. You see where this takes you? The law is not going to help you. You're going to at some point cry out and realize you can't do enough to achieve this. You need to tap into what's already been done for you. And His name's Jesus. He's already finished it. He's already completed it. Now this doesn't mean that I don't fellowship with Jesus at all. But your want to starts changing and your motives change. Your motive change from I'm trying to achieve something to I can't wait to fellowship with Him. And it completely changes your life. You go from I'm trying to get somewhere in life to He's done it all and I just want to be with Him. And you begin to see the difference. Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. That's what Moses did. That's what the law did. That the man which doeth them, those things, the man which doeth those things shall live by them. The man that doeth the works of the law to become righteous now lives by them. Now, verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith does what? Speaketh on this wise or in this way. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Now, don't disconnect from this because I, I was really asking the Lord, what do the, this, does this really mean? He goes into some instructions here. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, or that is, to bring Christ down from above. Now, now let me ask you that. What would that be? How would you say in your heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. How would you bring Christ down from above? This is is what I believe the the Holy Spirit was getting across to me. I hear a lot of people begging for an experience. Begging for Jesus to do something. Have you been in prayer meetings? Jesus, just please come and do touch me. He says, do not say that. Can I have an experience with Jesus? Yes. But according to John, the very first chapter, the Word and Jesus are the exact same thing. So if you put faith in His Word, that is you fellowshipping with Jesus. But people want a physical body 
to come down and sit beside you, put his arm around you, and say, you got this, brother. I don't know if he's black. Maybe, maybe Jesus isn't black. Maybe he says, brother. <laughs> but that's what they, but it says here, don't do that. Don't, and, and I don't, I don't know, I'm not saying you can't have an experience with Jesus. I like when I have an experience with Jesus. I like when the Holy Spirit touches me. I'm sure you do too. I, li- I like in the presence of Jesus. I like all of those things. But I can live above my experiences. I, me- I remember uh, 15 years ago, there was a, uh, I was invited to some tent meetings. And uh, you know, it was a crazy, wild Pentecostal tent meeting. And people were jumping up. Some people were jumping. Some people were st- uh, praying. Some people were, I mean, there was all kinds of stuff going on. And, uh, and I had just got spirit-filled just uh, six months previous to that. And uh, it was, it was I, I would have said it was a good service. Uh, but I heard people wailing and weeping and, and begging God to do stuff. And, and I went away just being puzzled. And I was just like, what was that? Like, they're begging. I mean, they're down on their knees and crying and begging and begging the Lord to move. And, and I'm just, it, something in me was like, something's not quite right. So I remember calling Pastor Dale, and I'm like, what is up with this? These people are begging and pleading that, some, that God moves. And because and, I was puzzled, because I'm like, does God not really want to move? Does God not really want to move? Is He up there going, see how much you can beg. It's all up how much you cry. You know, I'm just withholding myself from you till you beg enough. And and then and and so I, and Dale just laughed. He goes, he laughs. He's like, oh, you just ran into a Pentecostal service. He's like, he's like a lot of people just don't always understand that the it, the work's been done. You don't have to get God to do anything. It's a been completed. It's according to my faith. It's according to me receiving what God has already finished and I'm just like oh yeah I understand that well then a couple weeks later I met a person that was also there somebody that went attended there regularly and you know uh, he was like oh you missed it you should have been there the next evening and I'm like oh what 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 happened the next evening oh I have it on camera there was these orbs floating around in the service you should have been there brother and, and, and that's all we talked about was orbs and how wonderful these orbs were and how this was just God and, and orbs this and orbs that. And I went away going, orbs? I mean, so we're going to talk about orbs and not Jesus? Something didn't sit with me. Something wasn't right. And, and I began to ask the Lord what this was all about. And the Lord begins to show me that it, people, see, people were having an experience. It's not that an experience is wrong, but right here He's telling us, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh this way. And then He goes into instruction. Do not do this. Do not try to have an experience. See, if Jesus would come down and walk among us, and He does, I truly believe He does. But, but if we would all see Him doing it, we would be having an experience. That's not how righteousness, which is of faith, speaks. That's not how this works. Now, I... Hey, I've heard testimony of Jesus walking through the crowd healing people and people seeing Him. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that can't happen. I'm simply saying that's not how righteousness speaks. Because if you're going to go after orbs, I promise you, you'll get off on the wrong trail. You'll get off. If you go after an experience, you will get off. 
just think about it. I, I want you to just think about this a little bit. There's an entire religion one state away that went by an experience. An angel from heaven shows up and says, I've got some more books of the Bible that you've been missing all these years. An angel from heaven. And a religion starts. A new religion. Because somebody had an experience. And again, experiences are okay. There will be. You put the Word of God to practice in your life, you will have experiences. What I'm telling you, that is not your focus. Your focus is on the Word of faith that was written down in this, in this Bible and then speaks out of your mouth. Go to verse 7. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? I'm not sure even how that uh, even would look, to bring Christ up from the dead. Verse 8, But what saith it? The Word is near you, even in your mouth. Say, my mouth. The Word is near me. See, he's telling you right here, the, if you understand that the Word and Jesus are the same thing, according to John, the Word and Jesus are the same. If you want an experience with Jesus, you open your Bible and you'll have an experience. I'm not against visions. I'm not against dreams. I'm not against any of those things. In fact, I think they're very valid. We have Scripture that says that we will have those things. But that's not my focus. My focus is the Word is near me, it's in my mouth, and it's in my heart. That is the Word of faith which we preach. The Word of faith. Having faith in His Word is very necessary because that Word is in here so that it can come in here so that once it's in here, it comes out of me out here. It's the word of faith that you preach. It's the, the righteousness of faith. How do I, how am I righteous? How do I become righteous? Let's answer that first. How do I become righteous? Being born again. And now I get translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. There is a translation that happens. My spirit is changed. Now I have become righteous. Now how do I stay righteous? How do I stay righteous? It's a one-time experience. All done. That's it. We might as well just... Uh, right at, if, if that's the case, that every baptismal service we would just hold them under just a little longer. Because the, everything's been done. And so let's let, get them to heaven as quickly as possible. And if, if you dunk them for three seconds, well then dunk them for five minutes. And, and hold them under because everything's been complete. No, you have a life to live. And you have a life to live righteously. And so how do you now stay in that righteous place? It's the words coming out of your mouth. It's the words coming out of your mouth. We said this last week. You, take, you have a problem in life. How do you counteract that problem? You, can, you don't counteract it. Uh, in, in fact, um, Scripture will tell us that uh, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Did you know you don't fight against flesh and blood? That's not your ultimate fight. Your fight is in the spiritual. How do you fight in the spiritual? It's by what you say. It's by what you say. Lee came over a little earlier today, so I was preaching myself happy at lunchtime. You missed a perfectly good sermon. And we were doing some things. By the way, pray for me for the next couple of days. My wife is out of town. And uh, I truly do need prayer. <laughs> and so I decided I'm going to, while she's gone, we decide we're going to quickly remodel some things in the kitchen. Not remodel. It's stuff we never finished <laughs> in our original remodel. Uh, you know, some, some remodels just kind of go forever. And I, I, I purpose in my heart I didn't want to be like that. And, and so uh, 
uh, I'm having to act on that purpose. And, and so Kim <laughs> went to see her mother. Her mother uh, hasn't been uh, doing very well. And we're believing that Kim has an amazing time with her uh, and she's coming back on Wednesday. So anyway, we started doing some remodel. Lee came over, probably out of the kindness of his heart, uh, just to make sure that I'm feeding myself and, 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 and alive. But uh, he came over to help, and uh, we vacuumed some things up and, and, and got some things going. And in the meantime, I started preaching to him, and he, he was sharing with me that he's got some bids out there for some projects, and, and he... Uh, uh, you know, he's just not sure uh, about some things. And, and, and so I started preaching faith. And I said, Lee, you know, he's like, well, there's always that side where I, I, I put a bid out there and then I don't know if I'm going to get it. Uh, so, I, you know, I want, to get the, I want to get the work. And so I need to put my price accordingly so I get it. But like, you know, I don't want to overprice it and then I don't have the job. So I quickly ran some numbers with him. We got the calculator out. And, and I said, what would you, where you'd be 100% satisfied with that bid? And, and he, and, and he'd come up with the numbers, and, and he's, uh, I said, he'd be satisfied with this. And I said, well, then submit your bid accordingly. Well, he's like, well, well, well what if, what if uh, I could, what if I'm underbidding it? I said, you just told me you would be satisfied with that bid. Didn't you? And if I would get it, I said, who said that it would take you as long as you think it's going to take you? What if it would take you less time? And, and I began, because th th this happened to me uh, after I got filled with um, the Holy Spirit and I began to apply it to my business. We would, we would take jobs, we would take bids, and I wrestled with the same thoughts. And finally, I'd come to peace with myself. You know what? I'd be happy if I would get this job for this amount. And I would submit it, and I'd say, you know what, I'd start using my mouth for that bid, not my expectation on whether I was the lowest, the highest, or the mid. No, I'm going to get that job in the name of Jesus. That job's mine. God wants me to prosper. He wants me, uh, because I will bring money into the kingdom that we can use to save souls. I'm not, trying, not being prideful about it. It's just the way that it is. I'm going to use that money more than an evil person would. And so I, I am going to call this bid in. And I had to reconcile my brain into this because my brain wanted to scream at me, well, if I give a certain uh, a number, then, then I may not get the job. So I remember one particular bit, so I started t uh, telling Lee this. I remember getting a phone call one day, and I got an irate subcontractor on the other line. I mean, it's one of them calls where you could be like, I hear every word he's saying. My phone's all the way out here. And he's angry. And, and part of what had happened is he was a friend to Sydney that I purchased the business from. And Sydney and him had an agreement uh, that basically Sydney would focus on Telluride uh, area and this other gentleman who lived in Denver and he would go to Aspen to do some jobs. Well, there was a day we were asked to go to Aspen and started bidding jobs in Aspen. So I had bought the business. I didn't have a relationship with this person. And so I wasn't honoring that agreement that Sydney had made. That was Sydney's agreement, not my agreement. And so I had, asked, I had been asked to bid a certain job. And, and this man realized that he wasn't getting the job. And the job was in the year 2008. Remember year? Uh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I got the dates wrong. 2010. It would have been 2010. So we were spirit-filled for a little over a year. So the jobs in 2010, and I don't know if you remember 2010 and 2011, but there wasn't a tremendous amount of work going on in those areas because of what they call a downturn. And so he's upset. And he thought, he thought I underbid him and got the job. And he's mad. He's like, if you ever install that type of flooring, it's that, that Schoten and Hansen from Germany, if you install that flooring and, and the glue system, you're going to be in for a ride because you don't understand. Well, he didn't know that I had already installed that floor, and I did understand what it was. And, and he's upset because 
he didn't get the job because he thought, and I thought at the moment, that we must, I underbid him. But I had learned some of the principles of speaking to my problems. And one of the problems that I learned right from the get-go after being Spirit-filled is I needed, I, I began to believe God for projects and jobs for us to do because we didn't have a whole lot of work. And God began to bless me. Then I changed my prayer. <laughs> because I ended up getting so much work that I didn't have time for God. And I realized this is a problem. So I changed my prayer. I said, I want high quality jobs. I want the best paying jobs. I want the top tier jobs. Those are the jobs I want. So, so I'm under the impre impression that I underbid him. He's under the impression that I under, uh, underbid him. Well, the day comes that we do the job. So one day we're in the job trailer. And, and I had made friends with the, the project manager. Actually, uh, they had a project manager. He took care of the money. His name was Blake. And then we had uh, basically the, uh, they had another name for it, but he ba ran the, the, all the subcontractors uh, in the house. And there was a different name, uh, not just general contractor, but th th those jobs get so big that they actually have two different people where a smaller job would just be one person, they actually have two people. They have the money guy and the guy that actually um, uh, schedules and makes sure that the subcontractors are there and doing their, what they're supposed to do. His name was Aaron. And uh, one day Aaron and I are having a conversation in the job trailer. And he goes, oh, we told this owner that he needed to pick you. I said, oh, really? I said, well, that's good, you know, I'm, again, I have, I have no idea that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm the low bid. And, and he's like, oh, no, no, you don't understand. You were $60,000 higher than the other bid. I, was, I said, I was what? You were $60,000 higher than the other guy. And, and, and you picked me. Yeah, because we've seen you do some work on another job, and that's what we wanted. You picked me because I was $60,000 higher. Now, this is back in 2010 when $60,000 was actually $60,000. Now, it might not seem like that much money. Back then, I mean, think, I mean, it, it, would, it would probably be equivalent to about $100,000 now. Now, you, you think about this. I began to quote Psalm 30, verse 5. Go to Psalm 30, verse 5. I had been doing this over, over my projects. What you find out, the more that when, when you work for wealthy people, they do not want the lowest bid. In fact, I had bid, I bid some jobs up in Aspen where I was too low and they threw my bid out because they want somebody that's going to show up and somebody that's going to do an excellent job every minute of every day on the job site. That's what they want. And they're willing to pay for it. Some people say, well, that's ripping somebody off. No, you just know your worth. They are willing to pay for somebody that's worth it. And you'll weed, if, if you go up in your price, you'll weed out people that can't afford you and don't understand this. Why? Well, I took Psalm 30, verse 5, and it says, For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. And, and instead of, and, and the revelation I had gotten previous to that, I would always beg God for favor. I would ask the Lord, Lord, give me favor for this project. Lord, give me favor for this pro I have favor with God and man. I have favor for a lifetime. His favor lasts a lifetime. And I'd submit my bid. Well, then the Lord started giving me an understanding and revelation that His favor is always on me. It never leaves. And so every bid I submit, I already, everybody else has a disadvantage because I have the favor of God on my life. Everything my hands, see I've been, I've been meditating in Deuteronomy, uh, in Deuteronomy where it says that everything my hands touch is what? Blessed. And since it's blessed, everything I do is blessed. I'm doing it for the Lord. It's blessed. And so I've been meditating on this. His favor lasts a lifetime. And, and it will get you. 
And I had been saying those things. Not just thinking those things, but saying it. And it, but by saying it, I end up getting a job that I was $60,000 higher than the nearest bid. That's what God can do for you if you apply His Word. Now, it goes beyond money. We understand that. See, that's just the money part. We've just started. But if you grab a hold that God will take you care, care of you on the money part, now you can begin to believe God that God, if you confess the Word over your life, God can do things on the sin part. Amen? Put it this way. Why do we have a whole chapter in Matthew where it talks about the flowers and the birds and how God feeds them. And it even mentions that Solomon, in all his kingly glory, wasn't even arrayed as a flower that God took care and loved and, 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 and made it. And guess who he made the flower for? Who did he make the flower for? What was the crown jewel at the very end of creation? Man. He made that flower that was arrayed in more glory than Solomon for you, Daniel. For me. For you. He made that. It's arrayed in more glory. God loves that for His children. He's not against you being arrayed in glory. He's simply saying, I've made things for you that are absolutely wonderful. And if He cares about the flower, and if He cares about the sparrow, does He not care about you in your everyday life? The bids you submit, the work that you do, the things you do, ladies, in your kitchen, the things you do outside your kitchen, the things you do with the children, some of the things that a lot of the world will uh, lift their nose at and, and, and say, ah, that's not, this womanhood business isn't that big of a deal. It's one of the most important things God has given you. You have been given some amazing things, ladies. You birth a living soul into this world. That is amazing. And so everything you do with that living soul is absolutely important. Amen? You, as a lady, as a mother, mother children, you give them something us men can't give. You give you're the first baby's security blanket. They feel secure with who? Mom. Now, later, there's things dad brings to the table. I get it. Dad's going to go get him muddy and dirty and train him how to be a warrior. And mom's going to have a problem with that sometimes. And mom's just going to have to stop helicoptering and release them. And, and dad's going to take over. And there's, then there's a whole other segment that dad does. But don't diminish what God has given you, mothers. It is very important. As you bring life into this world, as you mother that life and you nurture it, you bring a nurturing to children that us men can't give. And it's amazing and it's awesome and it's godly. And it's something God, if God cares enough about the flowers and the sparrows, He cares enough about you as a mother. Maybe you don't have a $60,000 bid that God took care of you, but His favor goes with you wherever you are with your children. And that is why if your children are... Be, are, are and and I'm, I'm going to speak frankly to, to parents here. If your children act out, if your children... Uh, there's issues and problems with your children. You as father and mother are here to speak the Word over them. That's what you're to do. It's not about you making them do something because you making them do something. Yeah, there is a part of law. I understand. I get it. I'm not, talking, not, not getting into that too much. But there's also a part of speaking over them and speaking the Word over them. The Word is your weapon. I wasn't sure if I wanted to get into this. I was trying to decide and I'm still maybe waffling. Lord, show me. Where are we to go? 
Where do you want me to go? The Word is your weapon. Hallelujah. I got two sermons in me, and I got 20 minutes. The Word is your weapon. The Word is your weapon. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. See, you know, the more I got into this series of faith, I started realizing, yeah, there is a part of unbelief we deal with in America. There is a part of unbelief. But you know what? I I believe there's another section to this. I think a lot of times we carry faith. We don't know how to release it. Think about it. We carry faith. This is why something can happen and and you're like, well, I was in faith. I did believe God. I'm devastated because I was believing God and it didn't happen. So you could you be in faith and, and, and not have exercised your faith? Is that possible? You guys remember the story where Peter and John met the man on the way to the temple, and they met they met met uh, the uh, crippled man, and it says Peter perceived that he had faith to be healed, but the man wasn't healed. Did you ever read that? Peter perceived that he had faith to be healed, but he was still a cripple. Does that happen to you? Do you have faith for things in your life, but you're not exercising? You're not, you're not using it. It's not coming out of your mouth. It's not being used as a weapon. Are we at Ephesians chapter 6? Go all the way to verse 18. Yeah, Lord, I agree. Verse 18. Okay, so we're going to start here in verse 18. But do you notice something strange about starting here in verse 18? (coughs) Do you notice something strange with starting in verse 18? Praying, always with all prayer. Well, does it sound like you're in the middle of something? Does it seem like you're in the middle of something? You're in the middle of a sentence, right? See, chapter and verse was not always there. It flowed through. You've got to sometimes back up. So let's go back to verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is what? It tells you what the sword is. What's the sword? It's the Word. You you hear people say, don't forget your sword, and they'll lift up their Bible. Well, that's kind of true. That's kind of true. But if I just grab my Bible, I'm not going to forget my sword tonight, and I just carry it. That's all I do. I'm doing it a disservice, am I not? Am I using my sword? No. How do you use your sword? Verse 18. Praying. Now, here's the problem that a lot of people is is how they pray. They pray thinking prayers. They think their prayer. Okay, just so you know, I'm praying right now. How can you tell I'm praying? Maybe I close my eyes. Maybe I don't. But I'm telling you, I'm praying. You know what silent prayer is at a meal? I grew up with silent prayer. Anybody know what silent prayer is? It's where you bow your head and everything gets quiet. 
And then you know when amen is when the person that leads the silent prayer goes, <sighs> then you know it's amen. And then you open your eyes. You didn't know that? Oh, come on. You should know these things. You don't know what amen is. I mean, I, I mean, you could still be praying from silent prayer from 10 years ago. They just left you sit. That's not how you pray. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We need to understand that our praying needs to be coming out of our mouth. You don't think your prayer. And I can verify this scripture with many other scriptures talking about it's the word of faith that we speak. See, just go back to verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. How do you do that? Take my helmet. What, what the, I mean, is this my helmet? Take the helmet. How do I do this verse? Take the helmet of salvation. How do I do it? Do, do I have a Roman helmet that I got with me? That when, when then any time I take the helmet, I put on the helmet? Is that what I'm doing? Do I take a football helmet? Like, God forbid the Chiefs, you know, in their helmet, you know, and, and, and put that on. Do I wear a hat? Do, do I actually wear a hat and, and put a hat on my head? Oh, well, you got to take my helmet. How do I take the helmet? How do you take the helmet of salvation? How do you, what, the helmet of salvation is simply talking about, uh, you know, salvation. How are you saved? How are you convinced you're saved? How do you take the helmet of salvation? Let's go back to Romans 10. Verse, uh, 10 verse 8. Romans 10. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. What word? That is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9. That if you, what? Confess. How do you take your salva- How do you take your helmet? By confessing. By confessing privately to the priest? No. If you confess with what? With your leg. With your arm. With your nose. No, how do you how do you do this? Confess with what? Your mouth. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe what? Where? How do you take the helmet of salvation? By confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be what? So you take the helmet of salvation by saying it. Have you ever run across people that aren't sure if they're saved? How do you get sure? By getting faith to work in you and you begin to confess it. I've had friends that weren't sure. There was a time I wasn't sure if I was saved. How did I get sure? It was actually considered prideful to be sure. Very prideful and such a deadly sin. Now actually what's the sin and what's pride is not following this and becoming sure. You can have a confidence in your salvation. The confidence comes through the confessing with your mouth. In other words, you're saying, Jesus is my Lord. Lord, Jesus, you're my Lord. I've been saved. I'm going to heaven. I'm a child of God. That's how you take the helmet of salvation. Now you take the sword of the Spirit. Nothing is changing. You are still praying, not thinking prayers, not silent prayers, but you're praying with your mouth. That's part of the reason if you come here Monday at noon, we don't just all walk around praying quietly. We pray out loud. We pray with purpose. We pray Scripture. Because that is how you take your, the sword of your spirit out of its sheath and actually begin to use it. Now you're using it. Now you're applying it. Now you're applying it to your life. Find the Scriptures 
for your problems. And instead of speaking the problem, you speak the word to your problem. In other words, you begin to tell your problem what your God is all about. This is not problem denial. See, some people take this message and they begin and they walk around and it sounds a little bit like this. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem in the name of Jesus. I don't have a problem. I don't have, or you could maybe it could sound a little like this. I'm not sick. I'm not sick and, and and you got snot hanging out of your nose. I'm not sick. I'm not sick. I'm just not sick. I don't accept that I'm sick and I'm just not sick. And I'm not sick and I'm not sick. And you know what? I'm just not sick. And you're like, well, you're a liar because got, you got snot running out of your nose. No, what, what you say is, you know what? I have symptoms of something on me right now, but I'm believing the Word in my life. The Word says that I'm above sickness and not beneath. The Word says that by His stripes I'm healed. That's what the Word says. Yes, I have a symptom, but I'm not going to go by my symptoms. I'm going to go by what the Word says. Because the Word says something different. The Word says I'm the healed. The Word says that, that healing is the children's bread. We had a whole sermon on that. It's, my, it's, it's what I get when I'm a child of God. I get and receive healing. I get healing for my body. It is for me. Because that's what the Word says. And I reject this symptom. I reject what's on my body. It's not allowed on me. That's not prideful. That's simply taking what the Word says and applying it to your life. You wake up in the morning. You just don't feel as as spry as you did the day before. What do you begin to say? Oh, my knee hurts. My knee hurts. My shoulder hurts. Oh, I'm in pain. Oh, this this hurts. That hurts. Oh, everything just hurts. I know I did CrossFit. Even at 40, you can hurt like that. You don't have to wait till you're 70 or 80. You can hurt at 40 if you work out hard enough. And every single soul of your body, uh, every single cell in your body is screaming that it hurts. And you me- need to begin to speak the word over it. You know what? My God has given me long life on this earth. I'm going to live a long and plentiful life. I've been planted by the tree, by the river, by the water. That's it. I'm going to I'm going to uh, bear fruit in season. That's me. I'm going to bear fruit. I'm going to bear fruit. And you know what? These achy joints need to hear that uh, there is a spirit of the Lord's in me, and it quickens my mortal body. The Spirit of the Lord quickens my what body? Not my heavenly body, but which body does it quicken? My mortal body. And I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to call everybody on the hotline and tell them how bad I hurt. I'm going to speak the word over my life. I'm going to speak the word over my situation, what I'm going through. I'm going to speak the word because that is exercising your sword. That is exercising your sword. Can you take one more thing? Can you take one more thing tonight? Because I want to I hit this. A lot of people focus on their weaknesses. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. How many, uh, you don't have to raise your hand on this, we're not here to embarrass anybody, but uh, you may have heard it said, you may have heard somebody else say it, you may have said it, well, you know, I have a weakness in that area. I have a weakness in that area. I'm telling you right now, if that's your attitude, you're not going to come out of it. Because you've accepted it. You know, another sermon that, not going to get into tonight Paul's thorn in the flesh the misinterpretation of Paul's thorn in the flesh has kept Christians weak and no ability to to come out of their sin Paul's thorn in the flesh a lot of people have more faith in Paul's thorn than Jesus stripes because it's what comes out of them I mean you just start talking healing to people and what's the first thing they say well what about Paul's thorn and you're like, what about Jesus' stripes? I mean, we ought to do that. 
What about Jesus' stripes? And step in a little bit. Like, I'm ready to go. Let's talk about Jesus' stripes. And we've made a mockery of what Paul was actually saying. He never told you to put up with your problem. When it says, my grace is sufficient, it means His grace has the power for you to overcome, not put up with. And people use that all the time, to put up with my problem. Well, I just have a weakness. Well, Paul's sworn. 2 Corinthians, verse 10, chapter 10. Verse 4. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Are we getting that? So now what does he mean, for though we walk in the flesh? I thought 2 Corinthians 8 says, walk in the Spirit. So here he says, for though we walk in the flesh. He's simply stating, you're in an uh, earthen vessel that you will be redeemed from later. He's simply stating that fact. He's not telling you to walk in the flesh. He's just taking the fact that you are in the flesh. You're here in the flesh. When I say, Marlon is here in the flesh, do we go, oh yeah, Marlon's trucking tonight. He's right here in the flesh, right? He's not trucking. He's here in the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Well, we don't go, there is something else driving what's driving. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Didn't we just talk about a weapon? What did we just talk about? Helmet of salvation, what other weapon did we talk about? Sword of the Spirit. So, so they're not carnal. What would be a carnal weapon? I mean, a purse could be a carnal weapon. Somebody could whack some. I mean, whew, this thing is heavy. That would knock somebody right out. I mean, you could definitely use that as a weapon. But, but, but it's a carnal. It's, it's a physical weapon. So, so we're not to grab real swords and start slashing, are we? That's not what we're fighting. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but what are the weapons? Mighty in God for what? Pulling down strongholds. But mighty in God so that we can put up with our weaknesses. No. It's to pull down the stronghold. The weapon we talked about in Ephesians 6, praying, is there for you to pull down the stronghold. The praying is not the silent prayer. It's the speaking prayer. It's the Word that we preach. Verse 5. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. See, you will get attacked where? In your mind. Say, between your ears. That's where you get attacked. Between the left ear and the right ear. That's where the attack comes. But you don't battle it with thinking. You battle it with speaking. Because how does faith come? By hearing. Hearing comes from what? The Word. So when you speak the Word, you hear the Word, and now God can actually do something in you. You can be changed. You have a problem, it can be solved. You have a sin, you can get free. Amen? Because it will begin to pull... What pulls down that stronghold is you speaking to it. Not you doing something about it. In the sense of, well, I'm going to try harder, read my Bible more in the religious sense. Right? Now, I'm not talking about 
reading your Bible to hear from God. I'm just saying, but I religiously, I'm going to go to church more. I'm going to do good works. I'm going to do these good works so that I can overcome my problem. You can't. But you can speak to it. You can speak to your problem. You can speak to your problem. And it'll begin. You'll hear yourself speak to your problem and faith will rise up and you you will begin to live a life of faith. And you're going to have a righteous speaking in your life. We're going to be able to hear it. You're going to be able to hear it. People around you are going to be able to hear it. Because out of the abundance of the heart, what happens? Out of the abundance of the heart, what? And you can tell that somebody's been speaking to themselves and, and is, grown, is, is alive in faith because of what comes out of their mouth. And it's not just theological issues. It's everyday issues. It's everyday problems. It's things all of us can face. And God wants us to speak to our problem so that that stronghold gets pulled down and we begin to think different and we get transformed by our thinking, yes, by the word, yes, but it's coming out of our mouth. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I hope and pray I have given you the foundation on how to overcome any problem that you have in your life. Any problem. Say any problem. The righteousness of faith speaks. The righteousness of faith speaks. It is my weapon. I speak to my stronghold. Not the, you don't have a weakness. You have a stronghold. And the only way to break the stronghold is to speak to it. You don't have a weakness. You have a stronghold. Strongholds are in your mind. Sometimes you can't get out of that thinking. The only thing that breaks that thinking, breaks that yoke, is the hammer of God's Word. But it's the the hammer of God's Word that you speak over your stronghold. Say, it's the words I speak from the Word, from Jesus, over my problems, over my situations. It's the Word that we preach. It's the Word that we proclaim. It's the Word that we speak. How do I overcome my problems? Speaking it. The more I go into this, I, I, unbelief, yes, there is a part of unbelief that we have to face. But the biggest thing we got to face is we think we're speaking the Word and I find myself slipping in it all the time. Because we're not. Just because I think it doesn't mean I spoke it. i got to think it and speak it. i got to think it and speak it because that's how faith is built so in other words a lot of us have faith but it doesn't do any good it just sits there and simmers you might be you might be simmering full of faith but nothing's happening for something to happen you need to speak it amen father i thank you for each person here tonight I thank you that the word that was preached tonight goes out into their heart, that they wake up tomorrow, they go to bed tonight, wake up tomorrow speaking your word, that they understand it is their weapon, it is their sword, it is what goes before them because they do it praying. It is what launches them and and, and they become a doer of the word through their mouth. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, we love you. Kim and I love you, even though she's not here. She sends her greetings, and we'll see you Monday at noon or Wednesday evening. Amen? Speak the word.